Eia. Ok. So, for this streaming session, which is one hour, I will walk you through what is the internet computer. I know some people skipped the first webinar that was uh, yesterday, but we will do a quick um, recap of what's the instant internet computer about. What is a canister? What is Motoko? How we can start writing Motoko? And so on. So for that, it corresponds to the chapter one to chapter three of the resource that you have. And I'll essentially walk you through all of this. So I'll wait just two or three more minutes and then we'll go over everything. And... Just finished level one, already submitted, but it doesn't show on profile. Uh, it should show up here. So, like, Mm, I should be at level one here. I will check after the recording, after this session, if uh, there is an issue. Okay, let's go. So what is the internet computer? Um, the internet computer is a network. So it's a cloud, kind of like Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services, where we host applications. And those applications are all hosted in canisters. So a canister is a container for application. Um, one second. Sorry, I'm back. Um, we have a dashboard, which is here, and it's the dashboard of the network. You can see that uh, we have blocks that corresponds to our blockchain. We have transactions. Uh, we have cycles, burn, which I will explain, and we have nodes. So essentially, we have data centers around the world that um, make the whole network and run those canisters. Oh, shit. Yeah. So if we go to chapter one, the first thing that we, we talk about is what is a canister? And this is probably the most important word of the week because the canister is where the application is deployed and where the users interact. When you create a canister in Motoko or you can use other languages like Rust or TypeScript, you write the code and those applications um, will be deployed on the network, and then users will interact with those canisters by sending messages. For example, posting on social media or sending a message on OpenChat is um, a message that you send to one canister. Same thing when you load a website. So for, for example, when you load the web page uh, of OpenChat or Discover or Motoko Bootcamp, this is going to be loaded from the internet computer, and it's a message to one canister. So that's what I'm explaining here. OpenChat, I already talked about that. One message is one message to a canister. Any question, I'll be in the Q&A to answer, so. 
one thing that is really important to know is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a very important concept uh, in general. It's not related specifically to ICP in the whole programmation world. Uh, it's very, very important to know what is what is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly, as you can see on this graph with the yellow, uh, sorry, with the purple little um, symbol here, is what is installed in the canister. So it's the module that runs in the canister and it's essentially a decentralized virtual machine. So uh, it's a virtual machine. So this is a very, very low level language, which we don't write. We write in Motoko and then it compiles to WebAssembly. Um, but that's what is installed inside the canister. So for example, um, the first application that you will deploy, you will write in Motoko, then the code is compiled and the WebAssembly module is installed. And a canister is nothing else than a WebAssembly module, in fact. So this is what um, this is what it run, is running on the internet computer. And the module is with the code and the memory is the memory of your canister. So you have WebAssembly module, WebAssembly memory, both of them together, they make your canister. WebAssembly can be compiled from any language. So it can be from uh, C, C++, Rust, Motoko. And the good thing is that WebAssembly has a lot of good properties. It's fast, secure, and multi-platform. Uh, so that's why they've chosen this, this language, not another, another one. If you're familiar with Ethereum, it's essentially an alternative to the Ethereum virtual machine. Now, what is Motoko? So Motoko Bootcamp, what is Motoko? Motoko is a language to create WebAssembly uh, module. So Definity, that the foundation that created the internet computer decided to design a new language for uh, beginners that is called Motoko. It's very easy to use, as you will see, uh, and it's very helpful for building canisters on the internet computer. Uh, the little ghost is the symbol of the language, the logo of the language. And that's how essentially how things run. So you write your code, then it compiles, then you install it, then it's in the canister and it's an application and it runs. A funny fact, actually, the person that created Motoko, uh, the, the architect of the language, is also a person that created WebAssembly. So both of them are kind of linked together. Um, and that's a really good thing for Motoko because WebAssembly is being more and more used in the overall tech industry. So here I explain why we don't write in WebAssembly, even though that's why it's installed in the canister. This is because it's too low level and no one would really understand uh, if we were to create our codes in WebAssembly. Motoko is easier to understand. Motoko file is a file with extension .emo and Motoko is a high level language. So you can compare it to JavaScript or Python uh, in a sense. All right. Um, now let's talk about what is the actor model. So let's go back to a playground. Every time we create a new Motoko file and new Motoko canister, the first word that you will read is always actor. This is not for uh, this is not like random fact. It's uh, based on the actor model. If you know the actor model, that's really good. If you don't, don't worry. Um, essentially, it's a concept in computer science that kind of create this concept of actor, which is a building block for running uh, programs. So an actor runs program. It has a private state and it can send messages to other actors and the canisters are essentially the same as actor. They have a private state, so the memory of the canister. They can run computation. They receive messages from or to other canisters. And they can even create other canisters. So for another a canister can spam uh, new canisters that you can use for like scaling your application. This is a little uh, animation that shows that canisters can communicate with each other and they respect the actor model because they have a private st state and they can only communicate uh, through messages. This is different from Ethereum. If you're familiar with Ethereum, for example, uh, there is one single environment, which is the blockchain, and you can read the states uh, from this environment. On the internet computer, each canister is its own uh, state. Like 
island of state, I would say. So if you need to find information about other canisters, you need to call them through messages. So this is a different uh, paradigm, I would say, which is closer to how servers actually communicate in the Web2 world. This is a really simple actor that I've coded here. Uh, we can actually copy and paste it here. Uh, let me remove that. I will deploy it. This is the simplest actor uh, slash canister that I can come up with. And it has two methods, change message and read message. One of them is a query, the other one is an update. So this is the candid UI. Uh, so this is the yeah the candid UI is essentially an interface that showcases all the methods of our canister. We have two in this case, and we can interact with it from the candid UI directly. So read message, hello, Motoko Bootcamp, hello, and I can change the message. OK, so that's good, and we can verify that it has been changed. The actor, so our canister has one variable that is called message which is of type text. And we initialize with this value uh, and it has two public function, change message and read message. So change message updates the value of the message, read message show the value of the message. Notice that there is a public keyword which indicates that those functions can be called from the outside. If you don't specify the public keywords, um, it will not be, you will not be able to see it from the candid UI. Okay, just one second. I will take my my AirPods. So there is some noise here. Okay, can you still hear me good? Is there some noise in the background? Okay, great. Okay, so we've talked about update and query quickly, but I want to go back on what it is and why we have two types of function. We have two types of functions because the internet computer is a decentralized cloud and like any decentralized infrastructure, there is a consensus that is behind it. So when you modify something, when you change the state of a canister, like you change the state of a variable or you change the code, you need to go through consensus. I've made a little um, animation here, which explains how it works essentially. Basically you send a message, it's spread across all the nodes, all the nodes have to run it. Um, some of them can be bad actors, some of them can be good actors. Doesn't matter because in the end, the majority will impose uh, the, the, the will, I would say. And that will be the state fi the final state of the canister. But to come up to a consensus and to have those nodes agree together, uh, you need to go to consensus and it takes some time. So it takes around two to three seconds. And that's why update calls take more time. Uh, a social media post would be a update call. A message on open chat would be an update call. Uh, liking something on social media would be an update call. Buying something like purchasing an NFT or a token would be an update call because you change the state. But not all of our interactions on the web are actually updates. Most of the time you notice that we actually just read stuff. Uh, we don't really interact. We just read and consume content. And that's why we have the query calls. The query calls 
they are used when you don't need to modify the state of the canister. And those ones are answered by single node. So you will notice that it could be a problem because if we are interacting with a malicious node, we could have a fake content sent to us. Uh, fortunately, there are some ways to prevent that with uh, signatures and uh, certified variables. I won't go into that because this is very advanced topic. Uh, this is for the end of the bootcamp or even after the bootcamp. But yeah, just so you know, a query call is way fast, faster because you only go through one node. And that's why it takes around 100 to 200 milliseconds to, to answer. Um, an update, a query call would be reading an article, loading a website, loading a video or a picture on any platform. I've made a little comparison table here between update call and query call. Update call are two to five seconds. Query call are 200 to 400 milliseconds. They go to consensus. Those one don't go to consensus. You can read with an update call. You can actually do it uh, if you want to load something with an update call, it's possible. Of course, you can also do it with a query call, but the opposite is not true. If you want to write, you need an update call and a query call won't work. One little uh, detail, update call costs to run. So you, you run computation. For us, it's not a problem because we use the playground and the playground is free. But for the query call, um, for, for, for the update call on the real mainnet, you would pay something. The query call are different. You don't need to pay at least for now. Uh, that would probably change in the future. The platform is evolving. We are still very early and there are usually proposals that are adopted uh, to modify some, some settings like the price or the, the speed. So this might change in the future. And you can ac actually access the canister because I've, I've deployed it. So this is like an interactive tutorial. You can go here and you can change the message. Uh, oops. You can read the message and then change the message. Okay, now let's talk about cycles. Um, cycles are kind of like credits uh, or gas on Ethereum, if you're familiar. Essentially, your canister is going to need to pay for everything it does on the internet computer, which includes computation and storage. And to do that, you need to load your canister with cycles. Uh, so that each canister has a cycle balance, which corresponds to the amount of cycle it owns. You can think of it as the battery life of your canister. And cycles can be obtained by burning ICPs. The main difference between cycles and gas on Ethereum is that on Ethereum, you would have the user pay for the interaction. So on Ethereum, if you go and interact with some smart contracts, you need to pay fees um, because you need to pay the gas to run the smart contract. On the internet computer, you notice we've used the dashboard, we've used OpenChat uh, and some other applications. We haven't paid a single cent because the computations is paid by the canister itself. So your developer or the group of developer or the DAO or whoever is behind the application will need to find a way to sustain the application um, and pay for the, the costs. This is great for users. This is uh, great for developers as well because it means you can actually make your user, users pay if you want, but you can also find other models. And this is called the reverse gas model. Cycles, uh, you will see usually they are measured in trillion of cycles. So one cycle is actually nothing, like uh, even one million cycle is nothing. We usually talk in trillions of cycles. So it's 10 to the power of 12 cycles. Um, and this always costs one XDR, which is a basket of international currency. So it's approximately like $1 essentially. So one trillion cycle is always worth $1. It does not depend on the price of the ICP token. So there is ICP token, uh, which can go up, can go down, but the price of, of cycles does not uh, change. Essentially what changes is the rates. So if, um, if ICP goes down, you will get more uh, cycles per ICP and uh, the reverse is also true. That's great because it means you can, as a developer kind of plan for your costs. You don't need to think, oh, uh, if the, uh, the token is going down, I will pay less or I will pay more. 
no, this is stable and this is like on other clouds like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, you would have consistent cost. Some operations are more costly than others. So what doesn't cost a lot is reading and updating simple, like coding simple functions. What costs a lot of cycles is usually uploading data. So like uploading files or photo uh, videos would take some, some cycles. And some operational, like special operations, like for example, canisters can do HTTP requests that would cost some cycles. Canisters can create ECGSA signature. Uh, if you're not familiar with ECGSA, it's essentially the um, cryptography behind Bitcoin and Ethereum. So you can create a pair of keys on other blockchain. And this costs a few cycles. If you want the full, um, the full cost, it's available here. And you have the detail of every single operation, how much it's going to cost. So you can actually plan. Uh, but yeah, for this bootcamp, everything is free. And actually we, we are not doing like huge computations. So it should, even if we had to pay, it wouldn't be that much. So that's it for chapter one. I will move to chapter two, which is really about Motoko and how we can create those canisters. Okay, so like any programming language, Motoko, we have variables. Uh, we have two types, immutable and mutable. And that's how you define them with the var keyword or the let keyword. So. Mm. Okay. Mm, yeah, I think you can, I hope you can see clearly here. So the variable can have any name. Uh, it can be n, for example, for a natural number. And it can be a let or a var, with the main difference being that a let is immutable, you can never change it, change it once you set it. A var is mutable, so you can reassign. Like for example, you could do, oh, I want uh, m to be equal to two, and then I change my mind, I want it to be equal to three. This would not be possible with uh, m. So this would throw an error, unexpected token. Actually, that would be like this. Okay, yeah, it's not mutable. So that's it for the variables, pretty simple. Um, okay, so this is a main point of Motoko. This is also why uh, it has been created. The main, the main thing is that canisters will be responsible for sensible information. Like for example, DeFi, a lot of money is on the line. Uh, or social networks, you don't want your, your data to be corrupted or whatever. So essentially they wanted a safe language for building smart contracts and canisters. Um, for example, if you're familiar with JavaScript, not TypeScript, but JavaScript, you know that you don't have this type security, safety. And so you can quickly run into issues where you mix numbers with strings, uh, which is not good. And Motoko is a statically typed language. So essentially before your code compiles, there is the compiler will check that the types are correct. So you don't assign a number to a text or the opposite. And we use uh, type annotation. So usually I recommend for the, the whole duration of the bootcamp to always annotate the type of the variables that you are declaring. So here, oops. I would define it as a NAT and I would declare, I would add the type declaration like this. We have different types. So we have the type NAT, which is natural number. Uh, it can be any number from zero to infinity. We have the type text. So the type text is a text, pretty simple. Oops. We have the type bool, so a boolean, 
true or false. It's true that in Motoko, the types can be also automatically assigned. So, uh, for example, you could just write it like this. And Motoko will automatically know that your variable is a NAT. But once again, we really want to be clear about that for this week, at least. So I always recommend to keep it that way. Motoko has commands, like any programming language. And in Motoko, it's uh, to uh, slash like this. So that's how you write a comment. And you can use some of them this week to add some information about your code. OK. So variables are useful for storing. Functions are useful for doing things. We uh, we will create an actor that is responsible for storing a count, so a simple count, and we will have a set count function, which takes a natural number and returns a natural number. We use the keyword func to declare a function and the name of the function. In Motoko, we have a lower camel case convention, so the first um, word is in lower, and then every other word is gonna start with a capital letter. So set count marks or like that would be this this convention. And the function has a type, so like variables, functions have a type. The type depends on the parameters and the returns value. As you can see, this is the function signature. And you will see a lot of those function signature during the, the levels that you have to do because each function that I need you to create has a specific signature that you need to respect if you want to success and pass the level. The function signatures essentially just says, I take this argument, which is a not, and I return a not. Why is there a async keyword? Asynchronous, so uh, JavaScript if you're familiar, it's async await. There is the same concept in Motoko. Essentially, when you call another canister, so if you're calling this canister from the outside or, yeah, you're calling it from another, another canister, for example, you need to wait for the answer. So to essentially inform the other person that you will have to wait, that this person will have to wait, that's why we have this async. Um, and all public functions declared here, so in the body of an actor, always have a return type async. There are functions in Motoko that are not async, but those will be internal functions. So for example, we could do helper function like, I don't know, like set count. This is not very useful, but I'm running out of ideas. So like this. And this is not a public function. You will notice this is a private function, which is only can only be used from outside uh, from inside the canister. This is not a sync and it doesn't need to be a sync. And we could use it like this actually like Yeah, that would that would work. Okay. Uh, why set count started with an underscore? I like this convention. This is a personal thing, but you will find a lot of Motoko developers that um, we also use this convention. I always have an underscore for my private functions, um, the one that are not callable from the outside, the one that are not public. I always have this underscore. That helps me structure and easily find which functions are private, which functions are public. Yes, you would be able to return. I just decided not to, but you could do like this. 
and we could actually do let's uh return like this okay another question why did you not give the actor a name uh yeah so good question we can actually name our actors so like i could say uh actor motoko or actor first gangster but we can also just say nothing it doesn't really matter it's not uh, mandatory to do it and since i don't know exactly this actor is like a mix of a lot of things doesn't have really one purpose um i choose to not give it a name okay so we've seen the public function we've seen the private and as you can see you can actually add the private keywords so we could write it like this. You can also choose not to, uh, because by default, any function that is not specified as public is private. So it's actually kind of uh, redundant to write it like this. And you could just not uh, specify it. But let's keep it for today. So Motoko, like other languages, uh, you have a control flow. So you have if and else, um, for example, this would be a very useful function, is even, and you would use if then a boolean and then else. So that's very, very similar to what you have in other languages like uh, Python or JavaScript. You also have else if, of course. You have loops, loops, uh, in Motoko are somewhat somewhat different from like how you write them in other languages. You actually need to use uh, iter. So iter stands for iterators. And uh, you need to loop within an iterator. So the simplest iterator is actually iter.range. I'm importing my first uh, package. So this is a big step. We can also import packages in Motoko. And actually, you need to import, I think in level one, you need to import the buffer library. This is how you do it. Every library, so from the base library, as you can see, we are importing for the base library, has a specific documentation. And I can actually, um, like, iter Motoko yes. library. I will. I think this this is already a link that is on the uh, the the set of resources that you have. But it's a very important one because it's the official Motoko documentation. As you can see, we have all those packages, and every one of them has a, a dedicated page. So this is the type iterators, and you can read later if you want this is how you define any territories and how it works and so on but essentially we can create a loop by doing for x in our iterator then we do something the one i want to use today is the range so let's say uh, public function increment count and let's say, yeah, we will just increment the count by the value that we provide here. Um, and I could do something very simple like count. Uh, count is equal, sorry, count is equal to count plus n. But I want to and return count. I want to make things more complex. I want to just use a loop for no reason, but I want to do that. So I will do for n uh, for x in iter dot range from zero to n. I will do counts 
is equal to counts. Ah, sorry. Count plus one. Okay. So this is just going to uh, add n to our counter in the end because it's looping n times. And I just need to... Oh, no, okay. We need to be careful with this. We need to do from 1 to n. And actually, if we were to do 0, that would probably uh, trap. So we would need to check. This is a really bad idea to do that, actually. I, I just wanted to show you a loop. But this is not good. Uh, OK, so this is how you would do a loop. You could also do a while loop. Um, so you probably know that. It's very simple syntax. Uh, you can see it here. OK, one thing that is very, very used in Motoko is the switch case. So um, switch case, essentially, it's saying uh, public function set uh, count to uh, set count, let's say. I have, I'm running out of good ideas. This is not very creative. Mm. Yeah, this is a better example. Let's say. Check value. So this is a, a boring function that will just check the value of our uh, x. The, value, the, the parameter that we pass in the function. And depending on the value of x, it will return uh, a specific message. So x is equal to 0, x is equal to 1, x is equal to 2, or x is above 2 for the rest. As you can see, the switch case lists a possibility, like all the possibilities. And depending on which case we are in, so we, if we are in the case of x is equal to 1, we will return x is equal to 1, of course. The main thing that we need to know is that for all the other cases, so like uh, everything that is not 0, 1, or 2, you need to use this symbol to kind of say, uh, for all the rests, I want to return this. So this is like in JavaScript, we have this switch case as well. And in other languages. Uh, again, you can combine that with variant type, which you can read more about in the documentation. And that's it for the chapter two. So the really, really basis of Motoko. Now I want to touch on the points of the primitive types. So we've talked about that. We have a few primitive types in Motoko. And you can see um, a few of them inside of this like chapter. We have the NAT. So this is one that you will use a lot this week. Natural number uh, from 0, 1 to infinity. So those are positive number. And this is what, by default, any positive number, uh, positive natural number is, is casted to. So if you don't specify, anything, this will be a NAT by default. Good things for you. Uh, oh, there is already an end. That's why we have a problem. Good things for you. In Motoko, the NAT will never overflow. So you have some languages where you can have a limit on the biggest value that you can reach with a natural number. In Motoko, we don't have this concept. The memory that is allocated under the hood will grow as the number grow. But we also have other type of nuts. So you can see that we have different types of nuts. Uh, if you go here, we have the nuts, the main one, but we also have nut 8, nut 16, 32, and 64, which are bounded because they are represented on 8 bytes, 60 bytes, and so on. 
Uh, we don't use them a lot though. Um, essentially for binary operations or saving memory, but otherwise we would use, we would use a NAT. Int, uh, like NAT, but you also have the negative numbers. You have the Boolean, true or false. We have the text that we've already seen. Character, a character is uh, only one specific string. So for example, it could be a letter, a number as a string or uh, a Unicode kind of character. So that could also be emoji or things like this. As you can see, um, you can iterate through all the characters of a text by using a uh, name like the, the name of your text, dot cars. Um, it's explained how you can do that here. One second. So, And all those types, they have a specific module for them. So if you want to play with the car, you can do it from here. If you want to play with the blob, uh, with the boolean, you can do from here. If you want to play with the text, you can do it from here and so on. So you always have like a specific module associated with your with your type. We have the float number, the bounded types, as I said, not eight, not sixteen, not thirty-two, and so on. The blob, the blob is a binary large object, so. Um, if you're familiar with, um, um, like, for example, if you're storing a file or a picture, you will likely use the blob. This is uh, how you store a la large amount of data, usually. Unit type is the last one I wanted to touch on. Uh, it's a special one, which is which I've already used, I think, um, because, for example, when we don't return anything, like, just change counts. But change counts but we don't want to return the count we can omit it we can omit it yes and um, we just need to return oh sorry we just do that and we don't need to return anything so like for example do m new Count. Let's do it like this. Okay. And yeah, that's it. Actually, we don't need to return anything here. We could even remove the return. By default, when Motoko doesn't see a return, it's going to return by default the latest uh, expression that we have. So here it's nothing because we don't have anything. And we could also do that, but this is just uh, another way to do it. So we've actually gone through quite a few chapters already, chapter one to chapter two and chapter three. That's what I wanted to touch on for this session. Uh, I can quickly go through some question. Yeah, it's like void. Okay, I think I will go through Candid, which is a super interesting concept. Oops. So actually, there is another language on the internet computer that is not Rust, not WebAssembly, not Motoko, and not uh, JavaScript. It's called Candid, and it's a specific language because it's only a language that we use for interfacing our canisters. Let's say someone that we know wrote a canister in Rust and we wrote a canister in Motoko. We want to use um, one function of this canister. So we can actually do inter canister call, which is really useful for composing services on the internet computer. Like if you have a social network, you want to connect with a DeFi application, you can do that with inter canister call. And you don't need to follow the same language. So a canister in Motoko can communicate with a canister in Rust canister in Rust can communicate with a canister in TypeScript and so on. But this is only possible because we have Candid, which is um, interface description language. So 
candid at some types, like this type, for example, not is a candid type. And it's going to associate types from other languages, like, for example, in Motoko, uh, not corresponds to not without the uppercase letter in, in, in candid, which corresponds to the big int in JavaScript and corresponds to um, U128 uh, in Rust. And you can also add more languages. You will notice that Candid and Motoko are very similar. Uh, this is on purpose. Candid was created around the same time that Motoko was created. So you will find it very easy if you are a Motoko developer to read Candid and like go from Candid to Motoko or Motoko to Candid. Other languages are a bit different, like JavaScript uh, is very different, but you always have a table which corresponds to which language, uh, how you associate the types. And so if I go to, um, so if I go back to the Motoko Playground, we actually have deployed and we have this thing called Candid UI. Uh, okay, I removed it. <laughs> okay, let's go to it. This Candid UI is generated using a Candid file. So we cannot see the file right now, but when we compile our code, there is a WebAssembly module created, but also this candid file. And the candid file contains the interface for our canister. Um, here we have a like basic file, which essentially just lists a function called square, which takes a natural number, returns a natural number. You uh, would see a candid file here with um, all, the, all the functions listed. And I'm actually going to do it. So I'm going to create a sample project uh, with DFX. So DFX is a software that we use to build canisters on the internet computer. It's not needed for the bootcamp to install it. Uh, but if you want to, it's good to do like local development uh, and all sorts of things. And it's really easy to install. So I will also add a link if you need. I want to use that because I want to show you how um, wh what happens when we compile a canister. So here I have, let me zoom a bit. Okay, it's too much. So I have my source folder with um, my canisters file. So this is a website. I won't look into that. I'm only interested by the Motoko file. And I have my dfx.json, dfx.json. Um, again, we don't need that when we're using the playground, but if you're using local development, you need a dfx.json, which is a configuration file. Uh, it contains your canisters, like where the files are located, where is where are the source files, and so on. All right, good. What I want to do is start a replica. So this is starting a local copy of the internet computer on my machine. And I will be able to do dfx deploy. Um, only I only want to deploy this canister. Okay. So this is setting up my environment, uh, compiling my code, creating a canister, and uploading the WebAssembly module to my canister. And with, we can actually see uh, we have a .dfx folder that is generated. This is also something that is generated when you use the playground, but we don't have access to those files from the playground. And if I go inside, I see canisters and I see a few files. One of them is a WebAssembly module file, so this one. Um, we can't actually read it. Uh, I don't think I have the extension. There is an extension where you can see the WebAssembly as a text, but as you can see, it's pretty hard to read. So this is the WebAssembly thing that I was talking about. Not super interesting. What is interesting is this file called .did, which is the .candid file. And this is where you see the interface for your canister. So um, let's go back. This is the same kind of structure. We have service here and the function. I mean, we only have one in this case, grid. 
which is listed um, here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, one other thing. You will notice that uh, this candid, files, candid file is also exported to TypeScript and JavaScript. So, for example, this is uh, this is dot did dot js. So this is a JavaScript representation of your candid file, and this is a TypeScript declaration for your candid file. So this is useful when you interact with a front end or from a JavaScript environment. You can actually interact with your canisters through those files. Uh, this is like going to specify the interface, so uh, you can call them from from that using those files. But we have a lecture on front end development, and that's not the topic of today. Uh, yeah, and the last part here is basically how you can interact with a canister from the command line. So we can use the terminal to interact with a canister, for example. I could use dfx, so dfx canister call. Um, I need to change the name, but like my name, I think is yeah, tests bootcamp back and I can can call the grid function, or I can also use the canister, uh, the candid UI here. And that's also working. So terminal to interact, uh, you can interact for, with canister from uh, the local environment or even on the internet computer. You would add a flag, or you can use the candid UI, which we've already seen. By the way, the candid UI is something that is live. Like there is a um, one candid UI here, which is for the whole internet computer. So here, if you know a canister that is already deployed, uh, for example, actually, if you are, if you have time to spend, you could uh, go here and So this is the backend canister of the Motoko Bootcamp website. We could go here and check the interface for this canister. So you can see that we have a few functions uh, like register student, get information, uh, some, some, some other things about metrics of the canister and so on. And so this is like the thing that verifies your project. And uh, you could do that with yeah any any canister on the internet computer. You would be able to see the interface. As I said, we can also use Candid in the front end for uh, interacting from a website to a backend, uh, but this is for another another day. And we've actually done the chapter four. So I went even further than I wanted to, which is great. We have five minutes, so I'll take the questions if we have some. Otherwise, I think there are some issues to fix. Uh, I've seen some people not having, uh, despite having finished level one, they haven't uh, haven't been updated in the profile. I think I know why it's happening, and I will fix that this afternoon. No question, is everything clear? As you can see, it's pretty pretty simple to build on the internet computer. I mean, uh, the bases are simple. Uh, then when you run into issues, it's a pretty early new environment. So sometimes you don't find the answer online. It's not like everything is, uh, yeah, it's not like everything has already been solved for you. So sometimes you run into issues and you have to find it by yourself, but the basic of it is uh, pretty pretty easy. Yeah. Oh yes, if you want to install the FX, 
Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's here. This is the command that you will need to run in your terminal. But as I said, it's optional. If you finish the bootcamp uh, after level five, there is a whole package of resources that I will send you about how to go beyond, how to build like a full stack application with um, like advanced features like Bitcoin integration, Ethereum integration. And you will need the DFX tool for that, but for the, the basics, you don't need the FX. Is there a link to upcoming networking session? So no, uh, actually the networking session, we will do it on Discord. I wanted to use another tool, but let's do it on Discord. Uh, just go to the coding room. I'll be there and we will just uh, have a quick chat. So yeah, I'll see you, all of you there. Am I might to use the playground to create the canister? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, actually there is an issue. Oh, wait. Yeah, actually there is an issue with the website. So right now it doesn't uh, increase your score when you validate a project. I need to update that. It shouldn't take too much time. Uh, I was talking to Shrub12. That's uh, normal. I'm sorry about that, but yeah. All right. So recording for this session is going to be available on YouTube in uh, one or two hours. Also the kickoff ceremony, if you've missed it, missed it, uh, same thing is uploading on YouTube right now. And for the rest, I'll see you in the in Discord. We have the networking session. All right. See you.